Οκ. Να πάλι καλησπέρα σας και καλώς ήρθατε στο, στο Καναδικό Ινστιτούτο για, το, για την βραδινή, αυτή τη βραδινή διάλεξη. Welcome to the, to the Canadian Institute. I'll, I'll let the French aside for her. Oh, un petit bonsoir. Un bonsoir. <laughs> bonsoir et bienvenue à l'Institut Canadien quand même. Quand même. Um, we have... Um, it's a great pleasure this evening for us to um, have with us uh, Shannon Crusom, who, um, besides uh, being a very nice person, um, is a very interesting scholar. And um, she is our, our um, Homer and Tom, and um, um, sorry, Homer and Dorothy Thompson a fellow for, for this year. So she'll be with us until the um, month of, uh, of May. Um, Shannon is, um, is, is uh, from um, Ontario. You're from uh, Ontario. Uh, she did her her her, her BA at, at, at McMaster University, and then her master's at Toronto, and said, "Ah, no, I have to go back to McMaster." So she went back to McMaster to do her <laughs> to do her PhD. I mean, she's doing her PhD now. Um, the title of her thesis is The Challenges of Representing Long-Term Histories. Um, that's also the title of your let him talk now, I just noticed. Eh? Uh, a Middle Pleist um, uh, Pleistocene uh, Anthropocene Case Study at Stelida Naxos. This is a, a really a very interesting uh, work has been going on there in, in, in Naxos. And um, a very, very rich, um, very rich site. So, um, a great pleasure once again to have you with us, um, Shannon. And um, I leave it to you now. Thank you, Jacques, for the kind introduction. Good evening, everyone here in person and those watching online. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Um, so tonight, I'll be discussing an overview of my dissertation, dissertation research titled The Challenges of Representing Long-Term Histories, a Middle Pleistocene to Anthropocene Case Study at Salida Naxos. Um, that, and I've been working on that here at, in Athens as the Homer and Dorothy Thompson Fellow. Um, this is a work in progress talk, so I'll appreciate any and all feedback at the end. <laughs> so just to outline my talk, um, I'm going to begin with the discussion on the background of Salida Naxos and its archaeological importance. And then the remainder, the majority of my talk, will be divided into two parts. Part one, and I will discuss my theory and methods and how a multiscalar time perspectivism approach to history at Salida might be successful. And the three main themes in my research, which are resource extraction, visibility and communication, and marginality. And then in part two, a bit shorter, I'll discuss my plans for producing these themes into a public exhibition. Um, so to begin, uh, Stelita is a double peaked 151 meter high hill located on what today is the northwest coast of Naxos, the largest island of the Cyclades, an archipelago of the southern Aegean comprises of a significant source of chert, a raw material used to manufacture flake stone tools from the lower Paleolithic to Mesolithic. So in other words, from approximately 200,000 to 9,000 years ago. The types of tools from the site suggest it was potentially visited by Neanderthals and early modern humans. So archaeology at Stelita was first reported in 1981 when Sephadiades of the French school at Athens identified the site's chert outcroppings and stone tool production debris. So the dates of Salida's use were uncertain at the time with tentative claims for its exploitation from as early as the Mesolithic or early Neolithic. The received wisdom <clears throat> was that the colonization, or the perceived wisdom at the time, was that the pre colonization of the Mediterranean islands was largely a Neolithic phenomenon with the oldest settlements of the Cyclades being only about 7,000 years old. And on Naxos, sites would have been Grotta and Zas Cave. 
These periods remained as the known dates of the site until the early 2000s when archaeologists um, of the Greek Ministry of Culture undertook a series of rescue excavations on the hill where they identified diagnostic artifacts of Mesolithic, Upper, and Middle Paleolithic dates. So in 2013, the Salida Naxos Archaeological Project was initiated to undertake a geoarchaeological analysis of the church source and its associated material culture. For the first two years of the project, work consisted of survey and the geological sampling of the raw materials, with diagnostic material spanning the lower pa Paleolithic to Mesolithic. Over the next five years, work consisted of systematic excavation. <clears throat> what the excavations revealed is that exploitation of Salida's lithic raw materials for tool making began in the lower Paleolithic, approximately 200,000 years ago, and continued into the Mesolithic approximately 9,000 years ago, making Salida the oldest site of the central Aegean basin. It was then assumed that after the Mesolithic, the site seemed to have been largely ignored until the modern period. However, the 2019 excavations uncovered a hilltop religious complex, a Minoan-type peak sanctuary on the peak of the 151-meter hill, with a dominant view over the nearby Bronze Age center of Grotta one of only a handful of such sites known outside of Crete. This was followed by another significant period of abandonment <clears throat> until the 20th century, when the hill has been variously used for farming, including terraces and grazing, quarrying stone for the airport, and the related establishment of a telecommunications tower, plus the construction of holiday homes. All of this makes Toledo the oldest site of the central GM basin, an all too rare location where different human populations visited for much the same purpose over hundreds of thousands of years, making it an ideal location for a deep time study of behavior in a fixed place. So the fact that Salida is an ideal location for a deep time study of behavior has led to my own PhD research and my goal to answer some of the project's wider questions surrounding writing and prehistory. So how do we write Salida's history? Do we do it traditionally chronologically, lower Paleolithic through to modern day? Do we test something like Braudel's long Thray, or do we use thematic hooks? Um, so my aim is to do this through a cross-disciplinary study incorporating archaeology, anthropology, history, and earth sciences to examine how we can meaningfully represent long-term cultural histories beyond the traditional linear period-specific discourses, um, as I just laid out and that dominate publications and museum displays alike. I'm applying a multi-scalar time perspective approach to the study of Salida, whose deep time history of human engagement with the hill spans the middle Pleistocene to the Anthropocene. My thesis will consist of two components. First, the development of a historical narrative of Salida, examining the structures, including climate and environment, and the themes, raw material extraction, extraction vantage point communication, and marginality rather than the periods through which we might represent deep, deep time human experience at the site. <clears throat> Secondly, I will be translating Salida's historical narrative into an accessible museological narrative to mobilize knowledge for a complex stakeholder audience, culminating with an exhibition and an associated bilingual website. <clears throat> Sorry. The overall goal of my research is to place Salida amongst the grander historical narratives globally spanning the 200,000 year intermittent history of human engagement from the middle Pleistocene to the Anthropocene. It will engage with current archeological discussions on the concept of time, particularly the multi-scalar approaches to history and the creation of accessible non-academic approaches to deep time narratives. Um, my research on how to represent archeology span of deep time will culminate in the production of a museum exhibit and website that will be thematically founded upon some of the deep time reoccurrences of human practice and experience um, and structured by natural and cultural timeframes. <clears throat> While situated locally and pitched at Salida's various stakeholder communities, the project's intellectual foundations and representational methods will hopefully have pertinence and utility for archeologists and museums globally. So part one, how can we approach deep time at Salida and multi-scalar approaches. So while there have been deep time analyses produced of the larger Mediterranean, including brood banks, the making of the Middle Sea, and Bintlis, the complete archeology span of Greece, uh, deep time analyses of the Aegean, we have the emergence of civilization, and then 
the Cyclades, including an island archaeology of the early Cyclades and the Cycladic and Aegean islands in prehistory. There's a lack of research in the region as to how a single site could contribute to such long-term narratives. Alongside this gap in small-scale approaches to the long durée, one can also note that meaningful historical narratives in the region tend to focus and begin with the Holocene approximately 11,700 years ago, somewhat struggling to introduce and meld Pleistocene perspectives. This was not an issue in the Cyclades until recently, with Salida the first proven Paleolithic site of the archipelago. <clears throat> So my research draws inspiration from the Annals School and the work of historian Fernand Braudel and Jeff Bailey's time perspectivism. So Braudel's significant contribution to the Annals School and methodology is his development of a tripartite multiscalar theory of time. The first scale, we have the long-term geographic or environmental structures, the long durée, which are described as an inquiry into a history that is almost changeless, the history of man in relation to his surroundings. Um, which unfolds slowly and is slow to offer, alter, often repeating itself and working itself out in cycles. The second scale consists of the medium-term social and historical cycles, which encompass the history of economies and states, institutions, social structures, societies and civilization, the social histories. And the third scale consists of the short-term socio-political events. All three operate synchronously, but at different wavelengths in time. So influenced by Braudel's multi-scalar approach to history, Bailey's time perspectivism offers an archaeological approach to the long term and deep time. Time perspectivism is defined as the belief that differing time scales bring into focus different features of behavior, requiring different sources of explanatory principles. Furthermore, it emphasizes the palimpsest nature of the material data and the variability of the archaeological record. In other words, how resolution affects what we can or cannot see about the past. <clears throat> Within time perspectivism, the range of time scales is not limited to those of Braudel's model, but can cover anywhere from millions of years to seconds. Each view would require different explanatory models. Therefore, while the time scales are relative and can overlap at any point, they are not interchangeable. Time perspectivism considers that archaeological deposits are created by many different processes operating at different tempos. Some of these processes and temporalities are knowable, as set by the temporal resolution of the assemblage, but time perspectivism also allows attention to be placed on the implications of those processes, considering artifacts, features, surfaces, and landscapes. So, I plan on implementing time perspectivism at Salida by utilizing common themes that are visible through each, throughout each of the site's exploited periods. So these themes include climate and environment, resource extraction, view shedded communication, and marginality and seasonality. Um, I began collecting this information through secondary research and three methods of primary data collection, including dialogue with specialists, semi-structured interviews, which we began la last week, and archival research. Um, the theme of climate and environment will re represent the slowest deep time component of my research. It will be the largest of the palimpsests as it covers the process of Salida's formation, informing on what the site looked like during each of its periods of use and how the site may have been accessed with regards to changing sea levels. Um, I won't be going much further into climate and environment today, but I did want to mention it. And then resource distraction, view shed, and communication, and marginality will represent the medium term in comparison to the long-term scale of climate and environment as the re ugh, resolution of the palimpsests is smaller. Events will be discussed as they become visible in the data. Although the more prominent themes like resource extraction could be looked at with a coarse resolution as long-term processes become, because humans use the site for its resources almost entirely throughout their history with the site by refining the resolution, looking to the medium term, we can examine the different ways that resources were exploited, exploited at different times. For example, during the Paleolithic and Mesolithic, the site was primarily exploited for its chert. During the Bronze Age, it was exploited for its clay, and during the modern period, it was once again exploited for its chert and clay. However, for different uses than during the preceding periods. The resolution can then be refined smaller in instances where more da data is available. Um, however, it can become challenging to make the scale smaller because of the limitations of data that we can collect from Salida particularly with regards to the Paleolithic and Mesolithic periods of the site. Um, dating techniques allow us to see a range of dates of when the site was in use. However, dates provide us with the minimum age of the dated deposit. 
the date when the artifacts last came to rest in their position. Furthermore, the hill wash, colluvial nature of Salida, means it's difficult to relate activity to a specific period. Obviously, as we move closer to the present, and as more data becomes available, refined scales become more accessible. At Salida, this is true for the Bronze Age modern periods, where the archaeological palimpsests are less, less affected by a hill wash, the hill wash nature of the site, and additional data sets, anthropological and historical, can be consulted. So, by approaching the history of Salida thematically, I'm able to examine the patterns or lack thereof of each theme through time. I am not devolving completely from a chronological approach, but I'm dividing the thesis into three central themes, resource extraction, view shedding communication, and marginality, and to examine how these themes occurred at Salida. I plan to use the theme, I've already said this, of climate and environment to represent the slowest deep time component of my research, and to use resource extraction, view shedding, communication, and subsistence to represent the medium term. This approach to deep time, long-term narratives, has proven successful, particularly when applied for public audiences. Um, for example, selected as one of New York Times' most notable books, um, Rebecca Rake Sykes, Kindred, Neanderthal, Life, Love, and Death in Art, utilized themes to present the history of Neanderthals in an accessible manner for both academic and non-academic audiences. Um, so by using, my goal is by using thematic variations of time, rather than the traditional linear narrative, uh, it'll allow us to decompress histories that have been distorted to fit the linear format. And by approaching history thematically, we can access histories in any direction at any scale. So, so far, I've begun researching my three themes um, through secondary, and I started interviews recently. So I'm gonna walk us through each of those three themes. So first, uh, the first theme I'm examining at Salida is that of resource extraction. So this is a map overlaying with each uh, material that has been extracted and where it's extracted from. Um, so uh, this is also the theme that I have developed for this in my research. So what is it? Resource extraction refers to the separation and removal of those natural resources from their immediate context context. Um, so the first, uh, sorry, in Aslita, I have thus far identified three main natural resources that have been extracted at the site, which are chert, water, and clay. So chert <clears throat> uh, is a sedimentary rock characterized by its hardness and durability. Uh, Salida is considered a major chert source in the southern Aegean, and radiometric dates taken during excavation, excavation suggests a history of prehistoric chert exploitation ranging from 200,000 to 13,000 years ago. In at Salida, we have lower paleoth paleolithic evidence of chert exploitation, um, which would be this artifact, middle paleolithic evidence, um, which that artifact. <laughs> Um, and the lower to middle Paleolithic Eslita is represented by non aculean and Lavalwa lithic technologies. Um, upper Paleolithic evidence, which circa um, 12,000 to 45,000 years ago, and diagnostic upper Paleolithic material is represented by early organization types, bottom middle, um, and then Mesolithic evidence, circa 9,000 to 11,000 years ago, and the Mesolithic material is represented by typical Aegean Mesolithic material, which is far right. Um, <clears throat> in the last few decades, so modern exploitation of the chert at the site, um, exploitation of Salida's chert has occurred in order to build the island's airport located east of the site. So construction began in approximately 1988. Um, and this is still an area that I'm working on collecting information. So this slide or this image here is the quarried portion of the hill and the airport is the long strip on the very right end of the map. So the second exploited material, raw material, uh, is that of water. And we have um, evidence of spring use. This is an image of one of the springs actually filled with water this winter. Um, evidence of jugs 
And one oral history describes a spring beneath the peak that was used by sheep. The spring was always full of water, approximately 20 to 40 centimeters deep, and would accumulate year-round in a natural tank. And then the same history states that following the 1956 Amargo Ghost earthquake, the direction of the water changed, and after the event, sheep and goats had to get their water from wells and tanks because the water was no longer available from the natural spring. Um, and then in the winter, water was also available from the base of the hill. And then the third extracted raw material is that of clay. Um, at Salida, four small clay pits are found in the northern saddle of the site. The smallest source is approximately one meter in width and the largest is around three meters. Um, so we have evidence of clay use in the Minoan and modern period. So during Minoan period, mud and mud in its refined form, clay has several uses and that most basic use was of mortar and the bonding material for stone. At Salida, the clay collected from the excavation to the peak sanctuary was used to form the mortar for the construction of the walls of the sanctuary. At about a meter wide, the walls were, con um, con the walls were constructed using the available chert with the interior and exterior faces consisting of roughly worked square blocks and rubble fill. Uh, the standard construction technique for rubble walls during the Middle Minoan period was to gather the field stones from the nearby areas and to pack them one on top of the other with mud mortar, filling the interstices. Um, sometimes these walls were reinforced and often a very thick layer of the mud plaster then overlain with lime plaster would be added to help consolidate the wall and protect it from moisture. And then clay use during the modern period. Locals would climb Salida's Hill on donkeys to collect clay to be used as insulation materials for the roofs. At the time, roofs were made by placing traves, long round pieces of wood, followed by canes and seaweed, and finally clay from Salida. This practice ended in around 1960s as the construction material of roofs moved away from clay towards cement. Um, and that is clay. So my second theme is that of view shedding communication uh, and investigating how humans over the long term have used Salida's elevated position to their benefit. Um, while the peak of Salida is far from the highest on the, map, on the island, 151 meters, above sea level at its highest point, in contrast to Mount Zass at 1,001 meters above sea level. Um, this is an image of Stelita taken from Mount Zass. <laughs> um, it occupies a striking position on the island and within the larger landscape. And then, as identified by a recent viewshed analysis, Stelita is intervisible with most of eastern Naxos, including the main Bronze Age center of Grotta and several surrounding islands. In fact, it is intervisible by um, as far as Crete. During periods of lower sea levels, its peak would have been even higher at approximately 300 meters above sea level. From the Middle Paleolithic, we have evidence for Salida's southern peak being utilized by Neanderthals as a hunting stand, while the same location was used in the later Bronze Age for Minoan type peak sanctuary, enjoying a panoptic relationship with the landscape with significant evidence for fireplaces and possible beacons or smoke signaling signaling. The sanctuary then having communications tower built upon it in the 1980s. Another importance of view comes into play with the construction of holiday homes and hotels on the hill, with many stating view as a reason behind choosing Salida as the location of construction and view being one of the selling perks listed on the hotel's websites. And Salida is one of the most expensive places to build and to holiday on the island with um, some hotels going for around a thousand euros a night. <laughs> um, and my third theme is that of marginality and seasonality. Um, so oral histories, documentary, documentary records, and archaeological evidence make it clear that the modern inhabitation of Salida is much, re much more recent. Prior to this, the hill, the surrounding coastline, and southern promontory were relatively marginal, owned by the parish of Ios Arsenios, which lays five kilometers southwest of Salida. The oral histories also told us that the land was considered poor quality, with potatoes grown on the promontory until at least World War II, and cereals cultivated on the flanks until the 60s and 70s. Additionally, prior to the construction of the road, the only access to Salida was to go down south around the beaches, so it was a bit more difficult to access. Um, so that's 
brief overview of my themes. <laughs> um, now there are some gaps but with the periods between the Bronze Age and the modern period. Um, and in addition to my recent research on collecting oral history, I've been looking at historical texts and right now primarily travelers' texts from around the 15 and 1600s. Um, they tend to mention the areas around Salida without mentioning Salida by name uh, because this area is where the salt flats on the island were located and the extraction of salt from this area has been practiced since at least the Byzantine period. Uh, Salida has also, though, been named on maps as far back as 1420, and recent discussions suggest that Salida and a peak to the south, uh, Mikra Vigla, may have been used to pass warning signals of incoming pirates to the main town. So I am still in the midst of research, uh, each of these themes with ethnographic interviews having begun just last week, and I'm planning to return to Naxos a few more times in the next few months to continue this research. Um, so part two, switching gears a little bit, I wanted to talk about the second component of my research, and that is the mobilization of Salida's history as a museolo museological narrative. Um, so this all kind of stems from the concept that archaeologists uh, have a responsibility to engage with their publics and mobilize their knowledge to a um, and this is a long-held position throughout the discipline. Because archaeology represents the heritage of all people, uh, we assume that responsibility to communicate to the public the nature of our research and explain the relevance and importance of such research. Um, and I have identified three challenges I face in meeting these responsibilities. The first being understanding the several stakeholder communities whose interests coalesce at Salida. Um, it has several stakeholders, including the Greek Ministry of Culture, Naxians, the local Salida population specifically, which includes hoteliers and seasonal residents, plus a large seasonal tourist population. The complication with this audience comes when devising ways to distribute information to as many of these people as possible, while also considering the various voices and concerns of all stakeholders. Second issue is engaging with the alterity of Paleolithic archaeology. A distinct problem faced with Paleolithic and Mesolithic archaeology, where there is often little more than bones and stones uh, which, uh, with which to gain the audience's attention. An issue exacerbated at Salida, where we don't have bones. Um, Paleolithic sites present particularly ch particular challenges to site presentation with their lack of architecture, cultural alterity, and a lack of historical connections to the present. And then third, um, my third issue is devising a method of representation that can uh, productively represent the deep time history of Salida and serve the d diverse interest groups. Um, so from the inception of Salida, uh, Salida, Salida Naxos Archaeological Project, um, public engagement strategies, the project's public engagement strategies, the goal has been to celebrate Salida away from the site itself. The archaeological site is entirely located on private land, and it does not have the, the right to invite members of the public onto the hill to visit the excavations. Um, developing methods of outreach that forefront and direct public uh, experiences of Stolita allows the project to respect the privacy of the site's land over, landowners. The project and my current goal is to engage with its public off-site, and this goal was partly the inspiration behind our first exhibit in 2018, titled Neanderthals on Naxos, the prehistoric archaeology of Salida. Um, simultaneously at that point, we had released a digitized version of the exhibit, um, salida.org, uh, to reach as broad of an audience as possible. We are aware that statistically, much of the visitors to our social media pages and websites were local to Canada and the Hamilton area, and wanted to reach those who would not attend the physical exhibit. Uh, the digital exhibit was released both in English and Greek, with the potential to add additional languages. So to date, the digital exhibit is still being visited and has had about 10,000 visitors since its launch. And in fact, just, week, just last week, someone told us that when they knew about Salida, they showed us the digital exhibit, which was really, really exciting. <laughs> um, so my research for exhibiting uh, Paleolithic archaeology began this summer. Um, when I had the opportunity to, to, visit, to visit a number of prehistoric sites in France to see how they displayed their archaeology for the public. Um, and the plan thus far is in the next couple of years to launch a second exhibit, primarily using posters once again, reconstructions, um, hopefully replicas and demonstrations, and continue 
developing the website as we gain more information. Um, so that's kind of, oh, I forgot to change the slide. <laughs> slide from our previous exhibit and us from the previous exhibit and our poster <laughs> from the previous exhibit. So what is next in my research? Um, I'm planning on continuing with my interviews in the coming weeks. Um, that's to gain more information on the modern history of Salida, hopefully getting a better understanding of the clay extraction and the spring use, as well as development on the hill, as well as continuing archival research, again, to bridge that gap between the Bronze Age and the modern period, modern day on the site. And that's, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Merci. Merci. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Merci. Merci. Merci beaucoup. It's very, very interesting, and it's a very uh, complex study because, as you say, there's a, when you have very you have a, you have very rich material, but uh, you have little remains, and and so how do you uh, uh, explain this? How do you gain interest? And how do you protect a site like that? Which, when there's development and building and, and pressure from, to, uh, you know, tourism and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, it's a, it's a very uh, difficult task that we we see elsewhere, but it's particularly difficult in cases like this. Is the is the area it's uh, uh, protected by the yeah? Yes. Yeah. So, so there's no uh, uh, development in development the and. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but there's a lot of you, it, it takes a lot of work to get um, the, the locals to understand the importance of the. And that's why we're trying. I think we tried to bring everything off site so that we can show images, and we try to take lots of photographs. We've done drawings of artifacts, and I think that's part of the the replicas will really and bring a bit more tactile. <laughs> Nest to the site. Yes, sure. <laughs> Do we have any questions? What? We? Uh, has it been established? Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. H has it been established that indeed there were Neanderthals in Naxos? And how do you know the difference between <laughs> the, the Homo sapiens people and the Neanderthal people? That's not particularly my wheelhouse. Looking at the the artifacts, yeah, the artifacts that it's the artifacts, yeah, yeah, the lithics material. Um, are but they different? The artifacts that came from different groups of people. Mm, I'm not too sure at that. <laughs> For that material, I'm going off of articles that have been published about the site. Um, yeah. <laughs> So I had like two questions. Yeah. One, I want to ask the travelers and who visited Stelida and do we have any general idea? Like, was it a positive opinion on the, on the region or negative or like board? Any like, opinions on the region, like in general? And you just mentioned oral histories and oral traditions of the region. If so, in the museum experts, is there any plans? I, I'm not a museum expert, I'm, I'm just a student. <laughs> I'm a undergraduate student, so I have no, I know, I know this matter. But I imagine that if in the museum, can it, can it be, can it be presented the, the traditions, the stories of the of the people? Can you tell like a museum slide or like some exhibit or just some computer AI just telling this computer, you know, we have chat GPT now, we can do something for this. We can just like this is plus play for the story about plus second next track next track something. Like that. And is, is there something in the plans of idea, brainstorming ideas? I guess it depends on the people we're interviewing and whether or not they want to remain anonymous or whether they, they want the story to be told through them. So right now, going into all of the interviews, they're being told that everything can remain anonymous and it's just um, facts that are being brought into the research. So that's a really good idea. I always like that the exhibits where they have 
oral histories as part of the, yeah. And what was your first question again? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> The, the travelers' histories, the travelers' mm. records. Like, was it what did they say? Was it boring? Was it fun? Did I, did I sleep on the beach? <laughs> you know, basic questions. Um, so they were from the the, the store. The histories that I've read so far from the 1500s and 1600s, and they're very brief, about one page stopover on Naxos, where they just describe what it looks like, essentially, and then they're on their way to the next island. Is how it, and then the maps as well. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot for this uh, very uh, wonderful presentation. I think you found yourself a really good topic for a PhD thesis. Um, I completely agree with the fact that we need to be good storytellers. Uh, it's, it's very important, especially in this day and age with rising pseudoscience and pseudo-archaeology, <laughs> ancient apocalypse on Netflix. Um, the need to uh, tell good stories and fill that void that exists for people that, uh, that are interested in archaeology but that just don't have the, the critical, I don't know, minds to, 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 to differentiate between good stories and bad stories. Uh, that's really important. So, very, very good topic. Um, the question that I have uh, relates to the way you're going to tell your story and then in particular the use of uh, reconstructions. Uh, you said that you were interested in, uh, in drawings. Mm -hmm. um, how, what are your thoughts on those? How are you gonna, how are you gonna make use of them? Um, with, the dra with drawings in particular? Yeah, yeah, because drawings are interesting because they, they, they are at the same time, they, they can show you a lot of information in one picture and people remem will remember mm -hmm. it. But at the same time, they also freeze the image, sort of. The image is all straight away frozen and it's difficult to then change it. So, um, what are your thoughts along those lines? I've never really thought about it, of the idea of it freezing it in time and more just it's bringing a certain aspect of the time period to life, especially environmental drawings and environmental reconstructions when those aren't really things that you can actually see by visiting the site. Um, so I think it's okay to have it freeze it in time, I guess, but having multiple of each drawing um, might help change that a little bit. Um, if that's the environmental um, an artifact, or artifact and environment. I, yeah, haven't started that process yet, but I, I would like to have what the landscape looked like because with ice age and changing climate things looked differently throughout all, all these periods rising and lowering sea levels and <laughs> thank you do we have other questions yes um thank you shannon it was very interesting um my question is you know unsurprisingly perhaps about the medieval period <laughs> and uh you were showing this map by Christopher Bon del Monte right the, mm -hmm. the one from 1420 right um so the convention at the time is to name only settlements and structures mm -hmm. so it's very curious to me that they will name Cape Stelida right mm -hmm. uh, so are you absolutely certain there was never like no. a, a tower or some sort of structure on Not the hill? Not certain at all. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah, part of what I'm trying to research right now mm -hmm. is because, well, so Piergos translated English means tower. Is that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one of the other names for Salida is Piergos. Mm -hmm. um, but whether we know, we know the peak sanctuary was there. We don't know if that was the tower that yeah. was being referred to. We awesome. don't know if there's other structures yet. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to that's get from the historical research. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for Shannon? Good. Shannon, <laughs> this was very good, eh? Thanks. I like this, this public archaeology thing and how we get this done and everything. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, very um, um, modern <laughs> approach to things. I'm very happy. Okay, thank you very much.